Pastor Mick Foster. <laughs> Good morning, church. Maranatha. Tim, will you get the fans on the way by there, please? Yeah. Thank you. Well, this is, uh, what special day is this on the calendar? Father's Day. I was praying about what to share, and, and I believe the Lord wanted me to talk about the best father of all. So, we're going to talk about our Heavenly Father today, and hope that uh, as we as we look at Him more closely today, that um, God might use this time to strengthen our relationships with Him, our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Now you notice it, does, it says, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're children of God. That means if you are following the Holy Spirit, listening and obeying the Holy Spirit, you are a child of God. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you, have not, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit. In other words, we're not forced into this relationship with God. And he's going to snap, uh, snap the whip on us. No, instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. We have been adopted by him. Let's read on here, verse 16. For his spirit, that's capital S, joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. That's how one of the major ways we know we're a child of God is when uh, the Holy Spirit inside us speaks to our spirit in such a way, witnesses somehow that we don't wonder whether we're saved or not. We know. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Since we are his children, we are his heirs. So he has adopted us into his family. We carry his name. And we also get full rights as heirs, which means whatever he has becomes ours along with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Our father, just because we're adopted, doesn't keep anything back or hold any of his love from us. Thank you, Father God. Full rights as heirs. It says in uh, 1 Peter 1, 4, that we have an inheritance in heaven. Hallelujah. So we get some of the inheritance here, you know, some of the blessings here, but there are many more waiting for us in heaven. Hallelujah. So when we die... We go to our Father who art in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, please use this time to receive our love to you and to tell us again about your love for us. Meet us here, Father God, as you have faithfully. Sunday after Sunday and year after year, faithfully met us here, your children. Help us to understand what it means uh, to be heirs of yours and to be members of your family. Tell us more about this inheritance today, Father God. Please anoint this teacher in Jesus' name. And the believer said, 
Amen. So our inheritance is in heaven. I started thinking, heaven. Okay, what about heaven? And what, what do people think about heaven? In fact, you might want to, uh, you might want to ask some unbelievers around you about heaven, what they think about heaven. Uh, most people believe in, in a heaven or some type of heaven. And it's very interesting to find out what they believe about heaven. In fact, some of the ideas they have are astounding. Where did they come up with some of those things? Then I started thinking, well, they get some of those ideas from movies, from music, uh, from TV, from cartoons. I think, start thinking all the cartoons I watched as a kid that, that uh, showed heaven or some, some form of heaven in the cartoons. Then I started thinking about Hollywood and Hollywood's ideas or concepts about heaven. And Becky and I just last night, we watched a movie uh, entitled A Matter of Life and Death, 1946. William Powell was in this movie and, and it was World War II. And he was a uh, pilot flying over Europe and uh, he, he was shot down and as, and as his plane was coming down, uh, the, other, the other guys that were in the plane, they all jumped, uh, but for some reason there weren't enough parachutes and so he jumped from the plane without a parachute and somehow lived. Someone had made a mistake in heaven and allowed him to live from, remember this is the movies now, don't get too serious here. <laughs> and allowed him to live and uh, he fell in love with that extra time he had and they had court in heaven and all these uh, wild ideas. And then right after that was another movie entitled Joe and it was also World War II, Spencer Tracy. And he was a pilot who also was shot down and he was sent back to earth to help out other pilots and other soldiers. And I was thinking, you know, it seems like in a lot of these movies, they're always sending the people back to earth again, as if in there wasn't enough to enjoy in heaven, you know, so they got to send them back here to do something to help people out and whatever. Some of the movies uh, bring up St. Peter's Gate. You ever see that in some movie where St. Peter's at the gate and he's got the keys to the kingdom and then he lets you know whether you're allowed in or you got to take the elevator down, right? St. Peter's Gate. Hell, Hollywood's ideas of heaven. And, and a lot of them have people getting white robes and, and getting to wear white robes in heaven. And, and in some of them, I've, I've seen it, especially cartoons, they put people in white robes on clouds strumming harps. You know, you've, that's a common picture, isn't it, of heaven? <clears throat> It's like there, there's no work there. You could just, like work's a bad thing. You know, so you go to heaven and you just lay around on a, on a cloud all day long. It's like they want to, when they uh, teach that when, when you get into eternity, no work, you can just lay back just like you were living on Easy Street. No. <laughs> and don't forget Clarence, our Christmas angel, right? Uh, what's the name of that movie? It's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart. And then there's Clarence. Clarence is sent down. Clarence was a human first, remember in this movie? He was a human first. Went to heaven, and, in, and he's working to become an angel. Full-fledged angel, but he wasn't at first. He was only a second-class angel. And so he was sent to earth to help out Jimmy Stewart. And, and uh, then he had to earn his wings and become a first-class angel uh, back here on earth. Hollywood's ideas. Hmm. And over the years I've uh, listened to people's personal concepts, not only outside the church and what people think about heaven, but inside the church I've hear, heard some pretty interesting ideas about what people think about heaven. Some of the things I've heard over the years some believe that in heaven, well, there will be no rain, no cold, no heat. The weather will be perfect all the time. 
no tornadoes, no hurricanes. You can grow a garden there and there'll be no weeds will come up and the garden will produce uh, blue ribbon fruit and, and uh, vegetables for you that uh, you can take to the county fair. And they have uh, in heaven, I've heard people say, there'll be flowers everywhere. Now I just heard Corey's mom, Jennifer, just decided not to uh, mow the grass and she's planting wildflower seeds all over the yard there. So apparently she's getting a little bit of heaven now, you know, here, here on earth. And if you, uh, if you like hiking, in heaven there'll be trails that'll give you gorgeous views, you know, you know, better than the Smoky Mountains, and we've been on those ones. Or some of them, some people who like fishing think that in heaven you go fishing. Every time you go fishing, you're going to come back with a lunker, you know, that's big fish. If you like golf, when you go to heaven, just think of what the golf courses will be like. Not only that, who are you going to get to golf with? Walter Hagen, Arnold Palmer, right? Some people's ideas of heaven. And in heaven, ladies, no cooking. Now some of you may like to cook and you'll be allowed to cook. This is some ideas I've heard. But others who are tired of cooking, no cooking. What do you think, Kaylee? No dirty laundry in heaven. Won't that be cool, huh? That's what some think. In fact, you'll have a mansion that will sparkle. No dust in the house to clean up. Huh? How about that? <clears throat> now, what do you think kids think of heaven? What do you think their idea of heaven is? I've heard from some they think it's going to be like Disneyland. There's going to be rides, food, you know, fun things to go see. But the most, most often uh, con conception of, of heaven that I hear is that I'll get to go to heaven and see my loved ones and be with my loved ones. You know, when you read the obituaries in the paper, oftentimes they'll have a picture of the person who just passed and uh, the spouse had already passed uh, some years earlier. So right over the picture, what do they put? Together again, right? Hmm. So the concept of heaven is I get to go to heaven and be with my loved ones or and my church family, the people I've grown close to over the years in the church. Now these ideas may well be, but where is God in that picture? Were you thinking that as I was describing heaven from Hollywood and people's personal ideas? Where is God in that picture? Where do we find the most accurate picture of heaven, brothers and sisters? Where do we find it? In the book, right? Probably one chapter more than any other describes it. It's described in quite a few places, but in Revelation chapter 21, I think you get one of the best descriptions of heaven uh, in the Bible. Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2. This is John. Now you remember that John was one of the original 12. John was taken into the future. It wasn't a vision looking ahead. He was actually taken there into the future. He was there. And he wrote what he, what he saw. Look at verse 1 here. Then I saw, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. Now get your, get your Bible picture of the truth of heaven here. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, you know, the earthly Jerusalem uh, was named after uh, the heavenly Jerusalem. I saw it coming down, made by God. This translation says uh, coming down from God, but I think the Greek translates better there as made by God, the new Jerusalem. Made by God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. 
So here we have a new heaven and a new earth and then new Jerusalem. Oh, by the way, side note, if you're reading chapter 21 here, I believe this is a description of the new Jerusalem, the holy city, during the millennial period. Because one of the descriptions of the city is the tree of life will be there and its leaves will be used for healing. Well, in eternity, nobody's going to be sick, but during the millennium, people will still be sick, see. So those leaves needed for healing will be useful uh, during the millennial period. Nonetheless, someday the new Jerusalem will come down upon a new earth. It says in Peter that God's going to burn this earth off with fire, cleanse it off, and then he's going to remake it again like the Garden of Eden. He's going to burn it all off because it's filled with corruption and sin, thorns, biting animals, and, and stinging bees. And he's going to cleanse it off from the corruption of sin, make it new. And then the new, uh, the new Jerusalem comes down upon the new earth. It sounds like it just hovers just, just above the earth. And, and the, chapter 21 says the, the city glistens, sparkles like a Jew, jewel. Can you see it? If you were a distance away and you were watching God bring it down upon heaven, sparkling like a jewel. Be like a holy glorified Las Vegas. That's how some people see Las Vegas, sparkling with lights and, and stuff, which is uh, uh, quite a draw for some people. I don't know why, but... Uh, and the size of the city, how big's the city? You ought to know by now, probably. 1,400 miles cubed, a cube. That's pretty big. And how many gates around the city? 12 gates made out of pearl, right? In fact, it says each gate is made out of one pearl. So be no imperfections. And the streets are made of, help me out now, gold. The gold is so pure that you can see through it. You going to get to walk those streets someday, brothers and sisters? Amen. Amen. And it describes a river, a crystal river running right down Main Street of the city with the tree of life on each side of the river. I think there's going to be gorgeous parks all over uh, the holy city at different levels, spread out, beautiful parks. Here we have a river you know, running right down Main Street. And this tree of life, it says it has 12 different kinds of fruit so that every month there's a new fruit to eat off the tree. You get variety to give you the life from the tree of life. And of course, the healing in its leaves. There'll be no nighttime there. No night at all. It'll be daytime always. But there'll be no sun necessary to light up the city nor the earth. You know why? The glory of God that will shine and light, lighten up everything. Remember, uh, God was one time, his presence was veiled in the Holy of Holies because men uh, were in their sins and they couldn't get into the presence of God. But remember, because of Jesus, the veil has been taken away. God is unveiled. And so he can, he can allow his, his uh, complete glory to shine and to glow. We won't need the sun nor the moon to light up a thing. Hallelujah. So, uh, what about God in that picture? Well, he was mentioned in the light part, but that was about it, wasn't it? All I was, all I was sharing with you about the, about the uh, holy city, the, the new Jerusalem. Many years ago, when my son Seth was just a little guy, before he was old enough to go to school, 
Uh, we were living at Mesopotamia. That was our first church a couple years ago. <laughs> and the church was only about 50 feet by 60 feet big. So there was no church office. There was no study for the pastor, for me, uh, to, to go to or put a desk in. And the parsonage didn't have an office either. And so behind the kitchen, there was a, there was a little room about a half a story higher than the kitchen. There was a door that led up to it. And that had been the old pantry. And so I converted the pantry into my, into my church office, and I was happy as a lark. No heat there, no air there, but I did have a window, spiders, bees, and those kind of things. Uh, but, but I was glad to have my own room uh, for study. And once in a while, Seth would come. And I'd see the door open, and it had a spring on it that, did, that would pull it closed. And I'd see the door open, couldn't see anybody, because he was so short when he started the first couple of steps, I couldn't see his head yet. Uh, but then I'd see that little blonde head show up, and, and uh, he'd come, come around my desk there, and I'd scoot back, and I'd lift him on my desk. I might get a little, a little kiss or a hug from him, but then immediately he'd sit on my lap and face the desk. And then he'd look up at me, and, and his eyes would be sparkling like he was in heaven. And I'd nod, go ahead, which meant, okay, you can open my drawer. Because I had this drawer on the top of the desk about this deep, about this wide, and it was just filled with knickknacks and baubles and things I'd collected. You know, plus, uh, there were cups on the top, and I had... Uh, uh, colored markers and colored pencils and all kinds of pens on there. And I had this little stone man. I still have the little stone man on my desk back here who had some bobble eyes, and he always had to grab that. Of course, there's a stapler for him to, uh, to handle and uh, reading glasses to put on, and there's nail clippers and a nail file, and a cassette player was right there, and and uh, paper clips and rubber bands and uh, a sharpener for my pencils but, and a sharpener for my crayons. And, and uh, we all know by now that I, I use crayons to highlight my, my Bible. It's uh, had the best price of any highlighters that I looked up was crayons. And make sure not to use too dark a color, though, because it can cover up the words in the Bible. Get the right colors. Anyway, to Seth all this stuff to play with, sitting on dad's lap at dad's desk. And the main reason for Seth coming up there with me was to play with my stuff. It wasn't to see father, it wasn't to see old dad. He wanted to come up there to play with my stuff. Now, what are you looking forward to when you go to heaven? Let's get a true Bible picture of heaven. I decided I'm going to look up a bunch of verses with the, the word heaven in them. And I want to do that with you right now, take you through a, a few verses. In fact, we'll just use one book, the Gospel of Matthew. I want to stop here and there at verses that have the word heaven in them. Now, as you look at these, get your own picture about what you see about heaven. And I'll see if you come up with the same conclusion I came up with. Now, let's start with Matthew 5.34. <clears throat> well, I forgot to turn this screen on up here, so I don't, my screen's not on. I'm going to have to turn around. But I say... Do not make any vows, do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. Heaven is God's throne. Um, let's go down to verse 45. In that way, this is Jesus again, you will be acting as true children of your Father in, where? Heaven. Let's go to chapter 7, verse 11. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, do you? You do, don't you? 
then how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? I mean, He's the perfect Father, right? This is Father's Day. We're looking at the perfect Father. Boy, does He know how to give good gifts? Chapter 16, verse 17. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. See heaven again? Chapter 18, verse 10. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, God's children. You're included in the little ones, by the way. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. Chapter 23, verse 9. And don't address anyone here on earth as Father, for only God in heaven is your Father. Did you draw any conclusions from looking at the word heaven in these verses? Here's one, here's one conclusion I drew. Heaven is where the Father is. Did you notice that? The Father and heaven were always together. In these verses, we cannot separate God the Father from heaven. Now, I was doing that earlier as I was commenting on the book of Revelation, but all these other scriptures show can't do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. Let's go down to verse 8 now. Yes, we are fully confident, fully confident, we're talking about you right here, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will, be, we will be at home with the Lord. Where? In heaven, right? We would rather be away from these, the older you get, we'd rather be away from these earthly bodies. The more goes wrong with the body. Right, Mike? Yep. <clears throat> and so that's one way God's preparing us to desire heaven where we will get these new bodies. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> But did you notice from these verses in Corinthians that the eternal dwelling place for the saints is where? In heaven with the Father. Amen. <clears throat> now let's go back to uh, Revelation chapter 21 again. Let's go back to verse 2 and verse 3. We have it up there? Didn't pop up in the first service. Just listen closely. And I saw the holy city, John said, the new Jerusalem coming down, made by God from out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, I don't think a, a young lady looks any more beautiful than she does on her wedding day when she gets all decked out. <clears throat> Verse 3. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. The time is coming when the Father will be with us, person to person. Another place it says, We will see his face, the Father's face, you and I face to face with the Father. That day is coming. That's why he made you. He made you because he wants to spend eternity with you in such a relationship that, we, that you know him face to face. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, now listen closely. What do we get from this? Heaven is God's home. 
right? See that clearly in these scriptures. Or more accurately, listen, more accurately, wherever the Father is, is heaven. That's what I got from all these scriptures. Wherever the Father is, is heaven. Which is bigger? Who is bigger? The, is the Father bigger or is heaven bigger? Who is greater? Is the Father greater or is heaven greater? The Father is, isn't he? He's the, he's, the, he's the maker of everything. He rules over everything. He doesn't have to leave and come back to heaven. Wherever he goes is where heaven is. Isn't that beautiful? Hallelujah. Now just for a moment here, I want to turn this around and look at how some other people may look at heaven. In fact, there are many people who would not like heaven won't like it wouldn't like it in philippians chapter 3 philippians 3 verse 18 now this is paul talking to the believers at philippi remember he started this church he probably led most of these people to jesus and now he's gone and he's still been uh, starting new churches, and now he's writing a letter back to the church at Philippi. And he says to them, I've told you before, often, and I say it again with tears in my eyes. He loved them. So what he's, what he's got to say brings tears to him. That there are many, he's writing to the church, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. Jesus died on the cross to set us free from sins and the penalty of sin. But apparently there were many still in the church there who were acting like people in the world, still acting like, still cussing, still drinking, still listening to the wrong stuff, still going to the wrong places. And verse 19, they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things to each other. And they think only about life here on this earth. One of the signs that there's world, they're just still worldly people. That they don't know the Father. All they think about is stuff here on earth, activities here on earth. And Paul said, when you first put your faith in Jesus, you died to all of that. But here you are again, going back and acting just like the, the people of the world. Broke his heart. Those people would not be comfortable in heaven nor would the unbelievers. They would not be comfortable in heaven. I mean, in heaven, people are going to be bowing down before God, not only on their knees, I think we'll be on our faces, on the floor, before our God, so grateful for being there and what He's done for us. In heaven, there'll be loud praises unto God. There won't be anybody sitting in the, standing in the back of the sanctuary and not even singing, you know, while the, while the, when we're allowed to sing, <laughs> you know, while the, while the music's gone. <laughs> they wouldn't like it in heaven. In heaven, there's going to be endless praise. These, these people be, be in heaven thinking, boy, this is a long service. When are we going to get out of this so I can go home and eat? I've got things to do today. Hmm. They wouldn't be happy in heaven. In a few places in the Bible, it tells about us dancing in heaven. Just being so free, loving God so much, that in worship we just let it all loose and we dance before Him. Now that's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable 
And there's another reason they wouldn't like to be in heaven. Hmm. When I was back in, uh, in college in my fraternity, we were a party in fraternity. And I can still remember singing this song. It sort of describes the kind of people here that won't like heaven. <clears throat> Maybe a few of you who are old, or old like me might have heard this song before, but it goes like this. In heaven there is no beer, that's why we drink it here. And when we're gone from here, all our friends will be drinking all the beer. They would not be comfortable in heaven. <laughs> Never heard that one, huh? You were in the right circles, Lottie. <laughs> Also in heaven, some people wouldn't like it there because there's no marriage in heaven. Remember back to those obituaries with the, with the wording up, together again. No, there's no marriage in heaven. In the morning, some, some, some lady yelled, praise the Lord. We all looked at her. <laughs> I had a lady leave a church one time when, when I was teaching that there's no marriage in heaven. She was so upset over that. Yeah, I don't think she'd be comfortable in heaven. You see, there's a reason there's no marriage in heaven. Think about it. What do you think it is? Why is there no marriage in heaven? Yes. God the Father, Jesus, they want to be closer to us than anybody else. God wants to be closer to you. He doesn't want anyone to be closer to you than him. He made you for that. That kind of fellowship, that kind of relationship, that kind of family. No marriage in heaven. So, brothers and sisters, why would we desire to be with the Father throughout all eternity? Do you have a heart for that? Well, we know from these scriptures, from the Bible, that He delivers us from anything that might damage us, especially that which would damage us the most. Breaks His heart to see us hurt. So in, back in Revelation 21, now we're down to verse 4. Remember, it said in verse 3, 21, 3, God's home is now among his people. He will be with them personally. Verse 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Whatever had, bringing them, had brought them sorrow or brought us sorrow, in life. God himself, the Father himself, wants to wipe that tear, those tears away himself. That's how much he loves you. And then it says, I mean, that's a good father, isn't it? That's a father who shows love, isn't it? Then it says, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Your Father in heaven has taken care of all of that stuff. Hallelujah. Why should we want to spend eternity with the Father? Well, He delivered us from sin because it hurts. Brings pain and sorrow to ourselves and those we sin against, right? And so the Father has delivered us from alcohol. He's delivered us from foul mouths. He's delivered us from drugs and cigarettes. He's delivered us from sexual immorality because it brings sorrow and pain. He's delivered us from unforgiveness. You'll never have a negative thought about somebody else ever again. Won't that be sweet? So he's delivered us from covetousness. 
I gotta have this, I gotta go there, I want that. So and so's got one, they gotta. And he's delivered us from rebellion against him. Hallelujah. And in place of all of that, he gives us the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. This is what he gives us instead. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love. Joy. Peace. You want those in your heart? You want those in your mind? You want those ruling your life? Amen? Patience. Kindness. Goodness he puts inside you. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He puts those in place of all that was harming you before. Thank you, Lord. Did you notice God's greatest gifts are spiritual gifts, not physical gifts? Did you notice that, brothers and sisters? Now, the physical, physical gifts that he gives us their blessings from him, and, and they're supposed to show his love for us. Just like old Seth sitting on my desk, all those physical things to play with right there, I let him play with it because I love him. I wanted him to enjoy that. That's why the Father gives us physical gifts. But the most, the most important gifts that he gives us, the higher gifts, are the spiritual gifts. Amen. Your desire for the Father multiplies as your relationship with Him grows. Think about it. As your relationship with the Father multiplies, multiplies, grows closer, the better you get to know Him. Right? So we want to work on improving that relationship, don't we? Father, help us to look forward to you in heaven, not just the stuff and what life is like, but the real blessing of heaven is being with the Father who made you and I. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, forgive us when we think about heaven without you much in the picture. Forgive us, Father. We're just thinking about all that you're going to bless us with there. And for giving you a lower place in our heart. Lord, we can, only, we can only think like that because we haven't known you well enough. And so we're asking for grace to make our relationship with you closer and closer and better and better. Show us what we need to do to get to know you better so we can look forward to eternity, eternity with you face to face. Hallelujah. And Father, while we're praying, we who are children, we learn from the God's relationship with his children, that we who are children and have fathers here on this earth, we ask you to grow those relationships after the pattern that you've set between your children and you. Help us to work on those relationships too. And those of us who are fathers and grandfathers, make us better ones. Show us how to love and care for our kids 
and our grandkids better and better, following your pattern, Lord, building these relationships. Thank you, Father. And most of all, to make sure they all know you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. And those in agreement with that prayer said, Amen. Amen. Amen.